Mark Ferris, PhD. And um, Mark, could you tell us more about your work in academia in terms of religion and behavior change? And um, if you are seeing any early findings, if you're uh, willing and able to share, that would, that would be great. But if not, we understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, again, th thanks for having me. Uh, what a pleasure this is. Um, so yeah, so I think generally my, my, it helps to understand my background a little bit, I think, uh, and, and how this plays out on the theology and health side and the, the religion health, particularly with health behavior. Um, I had a fleeting career in the fitness industry that led me back to get my master's in exercise physiology. Um, and I, I just, I, th I didn't think I knew enough. And largely that was the early birthing of, of fitnesspudding.com as well in that I, I, I was intrigued with how one person would say this and another person would say this, and they both were saying they were right. Um, and my mind doesn't necessarily work that way. So um, I didn't have a skill set, right, to find science and research and read it and understand it. Uh, so going back to my master's in exercise physiology, I really learned how to do that. I got, I got really hands-on with research. Uh, I began teaching in these topics. But it was during that time that I realized, okay, I know what to tell people, but I don't know how to get them to do it. So uh, I was really blessed at that time. My mentor, uh, I actually did more of an exercise psychology thesis, master's thesis, uh, looking at women and weight training and, and, and adherence. And so uh, long story short, that led me to my PhD in, in behavioral medicine, largely, mm -hmm. is my field. It used to be more behavioral health, but now that's kind of been uh, sucked up under um, men mental health related things. And, mm -hmm. and, and I do have some expertise there, but behavioral medicine, if you're not familiar, generally speaking, it's we look at all determinants for increased risk of disease, disability, or death. Mm -hmm. And we are trained in a way of figuring that out. So just like we were talking before we kind of started the, the COVID response and the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, that's my training. What is this disease? What are the determinants? How do we figure out what to do? Now, through my research, I focused more on chronic disease, not infectious disease, and particularly um, physical activity, poor diet, and weight control issues. And what I ended up finding through that early research, largely the first decade, was that behavior change is extremely difficult for many people. Um, and so I studied largely under this umbrella of self-regulation. How do we, this kind of process of, of monitoring and changing our behavior to stay in line with some goal. Uh, and that, again, that's difficult. Uh, many people don't have that skill set, as you know. And so the, the typical academic response is, well, you learn all the concepts and the theories related to self-efficacy, self-regulation, self-control, self, -regulation, self, -control, self um, actualizations itself, whatever. Um, and so I did that. But then I started hitting a wall a little bit because I was like, if these things are so great, then why do people still struggle? Is mm -hmm. it the fact that the theories haven't done their part? Or is it the fact that we haven't developed programming and efforts uh, that maybe they're not where they need to be? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you read on paper about all these theories and these concepts and these programs, and you're like, man, these are awesome. But then you look at the results and, you know, there was 0.3 <laughs> serving per day increase in fruit and vegetable consumption. So it's like a bite of a banana. I'm like, so, man, there was all this work and it was grounded in theory. But so I became extremely in intrigued with that. And um, my, my mentality, which I've, I've, I've said before, was the kind of the just do it mentality early on, right? Was this is what you got to do. So just do that and it'll fix all your problems. But my research sh shed much more light on why we don't just do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've become intrigued with that. And the reason I say all that is because um, I had, had a moment a few years ago where um, it was sort of at a personal level, which translated to my academic research. And so I'm going to do my best to kind of wear both hats uh, today in my academic hat and then kind of my personal uh, hat. Um, and they do overlap to some degree. So I give a lecture uh, to my students and, and I titled it, Why We Don't Just Do It. 
And it's the introduction to a section of my, one of my courses that um, I, I give a scoping review of all of this, the issues with self-regulatory failure. And in that, I quote various people, right, about the difficulties of behavior. And, and one of those is the famous section of, of Romans 7, the letter that Paul dictated uh, related to his own struggle, um, which I, I want to do this, but I don't. I don't want to do that, but I do it anyway. And it kind of caps off with what a wretched man that I am. And so uh, I, I would always put that quote up. And it was such a perfect picture, even though Paul was talking about this pursuit of holiness, this overlap with the pursuit of healthiness was uncanny to me. I mean, it was a perfect fit for what we were talking about. And I did that for years, semester after semester, uh, thinking nothing about it. Uh, however, during my PhD, um, I had, a, had a, something that, that kind of engaged me then, but really came to fruition one day when I was given this lecture. And so if you go back in time, during my PhD, I, I was doing a lot of DEXA scans, body composition scans, mm -hmm. with our weight loss programming that I started, helped start there at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I was giving feedback on body weight and body composition to mostly women, and then witnessing their response to that information. Um, you're 44% body fat. You have 90 pounds of fat on your body. You weigh this much. It was this, I was told, or maybe not even told, just assumed it was a benign process to give this feedback to these individuals, but clearly it was not. And I became fascinated with that because I, didn't, I did not know what to do. I didn't know, um, do I hug them? Do I pat them on the, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, and some were ma mad and angry, some were upset, some were okay. And so me not knowing what to do, I began to research that. However, the more research I did, the more I found that there was something ingrained in these, these individuals. So there's the nurture aspect in society and what society expects, and that was clearly there. The way they were raised and the way they view themselves and their body, that was clearly there. But it didn't explain all of it. And so I, I, didn't, I couldn't find a theory to help me explain that phenomenon. And so um, through some recommendations, I went and actually took an evolutionary uh, psychology class. Uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, there's a gentleman there, uh, Dr. David Buss, who's one of the leading experts in the world in evolutionary psychology. Um, and I didn't know what to think. Uh, I didn't know what to th think about taking it, but I, I did, and he allowed me into his doctoral seminar and he, he was super nice to me. His students were super nice, letting the jock come over from the, the we were housed in the football stadium. So they were super kind and nice. Um, long story short from that, um, they talked about this innate nature, which they would, would say has, has evolved over time um, for sex or survival or both. And so what I got out of that, we didn't have discussions about creation or intelligent design, or we, that wasn't why I was there. But there was this treasure trove of research on this innate nature. That's what I was seeing in these participants. There was this, this natural drive for, let's say, attractiveness. There was a seemingly natural craving for high fat, high sugar food. Uh, this natural craving to conserve energy and be lazy. Um, and then, of course, physiologically, biologically, this natural ability of the body to conserve that energy as, as fat, excess energy as fat. So um, I became quite intrigued with that because now we're dealing with something that's hardwired and that can be enhanced to some degree by the... So now you see, in other words, you, you see this interaction of nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was told by a very s smart uh, individual once that it's not nature or nurture, it's herringbone. And I found that that was true, that this interaction of those things complicated the behavior change process. So fast forward to I'm giving this lecture, um, and I bring up Paul's quote of his 
pursuit of holiness and his battle, his war with the flesh. Um, then it hit me that that's the flesh and what these evolutionary psychologists were studying were one and the same. And so the, the Bible had been talking about the flesh. It just didn't have the research behind it. But there is this innate, natural, again, you could argue whether it's evolved or not, but the fact that it's there and that there's this research and this science showing that it is there and it's extremely powerful, biologically, psychologically. Then I was like, okay, if my craving for high fat, high sugar food is a fleshly desire or an app, in, in, in this case, an appetite, then why don't I treat it like that? If my, my, um, my uh, motivation to conserve energy and be lazy and not go to the gym is based at a, on, on a fleshly appetite level, then why don't I treat it that way? I treat my fleshly appetites for other areas, let's say lust that way, but why not these? And I became fascinated with that. So I pursued a study and where I got to academically is wondering, could I answer and figure out one, what do, how do Christians in particular is who I research, how do they view this connection, right? Certain health behaviors with their body and their Christian values and view. The, the simplest connection would be the view that the body is God's temple. And we've heard that. I was given a theology and health uh, presentation at, at Harvard with some colleagues of mine. And we went to lunch afterwards and uh, two of my colleagues there, they were like, man, don't talk about the body as the temple. It's been overused. And to some degree, that's probably true where we, anything, oh, we don't do that because it destroys God's temple. The way I was raised, it was tattoos, right? That, that destroyed God's temple or piercings. And so um, I became fascinated with that. So we did a study where we looked at, do, do Christians view um, certain behaviors as destructive to God's temple, but not others? So um, what spurred this was I had a conversation with a woman a friend of ours, she was in her early 90s at the time. And we were talking about chronic disease because as we both know, uh, all three of us, uh, it, is that seven of the 10 leading causes of death in the US, eight of the 10 in Texas are preventable chronic diseases, right? Mm -hmm. And so a poor diet being the leading risk factor, smoking number two, and physical activity being the third behavior. So um, I was telling her about this and updating her on this. She's like, well, you know, my pastor used to smoke while he preached. Mm -hmm. And this was in, in Southeast Texas where I'm from, East Texas where I'm from. I was like, no way. That's just weird, right? Thinking about a pastor smoking. While I, so I did the research. And sure enough, yeah, they, they did. They used to keep spittoons even in the pulpits uh, mm -hmm. so they could spit in between Bible verses. And now that might seem odd to us. But then I thought, well, me growing up in deep Southeast Texas, we went to a little church called New Cherry Grove Baptist Church. And you came out of the single aisle church after church. Nobody smoked in the service, but outside, lots of people did. Mm -hmm. Then I started thinking, well, what's happened since then? Like the 80s, early 80s, 70s, of course, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s to where now some would say it's sinful to smoke cigarettes. What, what happened? So to start that investigation out, we, we started looking at, again, uh, do people... Um, how do they view things? And so what we found was that uh, about 80% of Christians in our sample um, definitely believe that excessive drinking, smoking, and drug use destroyed God's temple before its time. Mm -hmm. um, however, it was half or less, so 40, 50 or so percent believed that obesity, overeating, unhealthy, poor diet, uh, sedentary lifestyle, and stress destroys God's temple before its time. Mm -hmm. So that's where we first recognized that based on our, our theory, our hypothesis, that there was this disconnect. Now, they believed that overeating and poor diet, inactivity and stress were bad. You know what I mean? But it didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't like cross this line. And we actually asked if it was <laughs> sinful or not. And, and we found that they just didn't believe in this sample, at least, that it, that it was. So then what that has done, and we have another study like that in college students where we're looking at the same thing. Um, and we, we are finding that certain health behaviors are internalized, as we call it in health psychology, um, from self-determination theory, integrated 
into their Christian values. <clears throat> so I talked with Richard Ryan, who's one of the two guys from the self-determination theory. He did a study in 1993 that looked at the integration or internalization of religious behaviors into one's overall identity, overall value system. And just so we're on the same page, right? So identity is, is self-concept. So it's this idea of, um, which I'll talk a little bit about actually in the, in the plant-based conference, but when somebody clicks over and says, I'm a healthy eater, I'm an exerciser, I'm a CrossFitter, I'm a vegan, I'm a whatever, that behavior, that lifestyle, <clears throat> excuse me, is now integrated into who they are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's good and bad of that, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we, we want to stay consistent with those identities. And so we can do really good behaviors to stay consistent. We can do really bad behaviors to stay consistent, mm -hmm. depending on what that is. Um, well, he found that those, those Christians in his sample who had religious behaviors, going to church, reading the Bible, sharing your faith, volunteering at church, et cetera, integrated into who they were, had, were much more, they're, they're, they had more psychological thriving, in other words, mm -hmm. uh, let less mental health issues. However, those who did it out of obligation or guilt, what's called an introjection, uh, had much higher mental health concerns. Mm -hmm. So it was like they were doing it out of, out of those uh, religious obliga ob obligatory sort of, I have to do this right. or I feel guilty if I don't. But those who did it naturally because that's who they are and they crave that and very autonomous and self-determined, so to speak, uh, were, were, were thriving. So I became fascinated with that. So I talked to Dr. Ryan about, has anybody looked at internalizing health behavior, not into your overall identity, but to your religious identity, mm -hmm. uh, your, your values and who you believe you are religiously, in, in our example, Christianity. And he, he said he didn't know, no. So that's what I'm doing now is mm -hmm. I'm looking at, and I'll, I'll give you some of those results, is I'm, I'm looking at um, one confirming. So one issue is, in, as you know, in health psychology or any psychology in general behavior is, Sometimes you have measures to measure things and sometimes you don't. So um, when I was looking at emotional and coping responses in women to weight related stressors, there was really no good measure for me to assess those things. So that was my dissertation was developing a measure to do that. So what we've done is we've created what's called the, what I, we're calling now the Christian health internalization scale. So if you were asked questions, for example, um, how central are the following behaviors to your Christian values or identity, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I said, going to church. And I gave you a scale from like one to seven. You'd be able to rate that on yours. How central is that to your Christian values or um, identity? Reading the Bible, sharing your faith, loving others, right? You could do a whole list. Right. So um, what about avoiding smoking tobacco? Is that central? How central is that? What about uh, avoiding illicit illegal drugs? Mm -hmm. What about um, drinking too much, like avoiding drinking too much alcohol? How does that sit? And so our hypothesis was that in general, on average, self-reported Christians would internalize with some variation the religious behaviors to a higher degree than they would any health behavior generally. However, our second hypothesis was that certain health behaviors would be internalized to a higher degree than other health behaviors. As we talked earlier, right? Avoiding smoking tobacco, avoiding too much alcohol, avoiding illicit drugs, relative to avoiding eating too much food, mm -hmm. um, living an unhealthy lifestyle, avoiding too much physical inactivity, avoiding overeating, etc. And that's with our preliminary analysis, we got one sample that was uh, 80%, about 300, 300 people, 80% self-reported black or African-American and like 90% uh, female, um, which was a sample we, we wanted. The second sample is about 50% women, mostly white um, men, like seminary type students and pastors and 
But what we're finding in both of those samples, and we're about to do the same in healthcare settings, uh, is we're finding the same thing, that we supported what we thought, that eating, eating healthfully, uh, being physically active, avoiding unhealthy eating, avoiding overeating, uh, and just generally living a healthy lifestyle are not internalized to the Christian value or identity near to the same degree as other health behaviors and not near as much as religious behaviors. Pew Research Study came out with a study in 2016 that asked um, Christians how central, uh, how do they word it, how central, I can't remember the exact wording, but how central are the following behaviors, generally speaking, to um, how, how oh, that's what it is, how important were the following behaviors to what Christian, being a Christian means to you? That's it. How important were the following behaviors to uh, what being a Christian means to you. Only 18% said that living a healthy lifestyle was essential to what being a Christian meant to them. Uh, dressing mod There were more people who said dressing modestly was more central and more important and more essential. Not that that's a bad thing. So there's this, what I'm getting now, in other words, is this clear disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so moving forward, um, with either Bible study, like the one I've written, an eight-week Bible study, or uh, maybe an hour, two-hour online lecture, something, can we get people to internalize those mm -hmm. behaviors or not? And so that's going to be the next step, because I believe that if you, that's what's missing. So I hope I'm not boring you guys. So No, no it's interesting. No. Okay, so <laughs> one last thing, one last thing, I'll let you guys talk, but um, so I, I look at these, this, the, the, the faith-based research. So I love the community church connection and actually the community church clinical connection. I really love that and, um, and, and really believe it's underutilized in, to a large degree. And there's people doing great stuff. And so I was looking at faith-based interventions. And again, you read the intervention, you're like, man, this is awesome, right? They were teaching the folks who make all the food in the churches how to cook healthier. They're giving them recipes. Uh, they were doing education, they were doing this and doing that. And you're like, man, this is, they had walking groups and all these wonderful things, but the behavior just wasn't changing to the degree physical activity and healthy and fruit and vegetable in particular, wasn't changing to the degree that everybody would hope. And so right now, from what I gather, that, that's the disconnect. So now I believe that it's because it's not internalized. It's just like yeah. any other health programming that I believe that, again, focus on Christianity, but arguably could be said with other uh, religions is that when people talk about religion health connection, most of the time they're talking about the social determinant, determinant aspects, the social mm -hmm. support and all that. And that is legitimate. But again, what I'm interested in is the theological depth. Mm -hmm. And if somebody were to internalize it and the light bulb go off and be like, Oh wait, I avoid smoking because it destroys God's temple. But that's the second leading risk factor for premature death in the U S poor diet mm -hmm. is number one. Mm -hmm. So why don't I eat healthier for that same reason? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I believe now that if I can help people connect those dots, mm -hmm. um, not only with the Bible study and research, and I'm writing a book on this topic, is if that can happen, now I believe you can move into any sort of health programming you want, that even if it doesn't have a religious spiritual connotation, mm -hmm. how do you cook knife skills? How do you shop and eat on a budget? Mm -hmm. um, all, all those wonderful things. There's so much, so many great resources for that. Um, and so anyway, I'll stop there. That, that's where I hope to go into the future. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to, before we move into theology and health ministries, I want to ask you a question about something you said early on about our innate desire to be attractive yeah, and yeah. eat unhealthy foods. Now I, I know the innate desire to eat unhealthy foods and not move a lot was to conserve energy because back in the old days, we weren't sure when our next meal was going to happen. So we didn't yeah. want to burn up, you know, all that energy and we mm -hmm. want to eat as much calorically dense foods. But, but the, but your comment about attractiveness, where does that stem from? Yeah. So it does stem from that, uh, the, the uh, research in evolutionary innate psychology. They, they, they have, Again, it's a strong, uh, a vast amount of research, um, cross-cultural, cross-generational. It's extremely interesting. But that's their theory, their 
theor theoretical explanation as well is that these desires that that we have innately again from their perspective that helped us survive like you're saying at one point the sex aspects are also there that would not only help with survival but mostly for your progeny right for the future passing genetics on mm -hmm. and having that strong desire for sex so their argument then is physical attractiveness is looped into that mm -hmm. it's looped into this natural desire we have to be and also some of their theories on social inclusion as well uh, especially in women also are, are encapsulated with this attractiveness mm -hmm. they they would theorize that attractiveness the, the reason I would find or you would find something attractive, physically attractive, someone rather physically attractive is because it represents some underlying level of health and fertility and reproductive value, mm. fitness as, the, as they would call it. Mm. Um, and they have some research to support that notion. Um, and they look at things from, uh, you know, uh, skin tone, skin color, lustrous hair, uh, length of legs, waist tip ratio, breast size, um, uh, body shape and body size. They look at sexual dimorphism. They look at uh, intra-sexual competition for mates. So women fighting against each other to get a mate, men fighting against each other for a mate. Uh, they talk about intersexual competition. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, but that's t the simple answer is that it's looped into uh, this natural desire for sex and survival. One, one example that's commonly used is the male peacock and that when he sees the female to attract the female in the wild, he throws out his, his tail plume, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to attract that female, but it also is like an open for lunch sign for predators. But in that moment, he, that desire for a mate and sex and to be perceived as attractive is outweighing any concerns at that time at least priorities for survival and so the interaction between those two become interesting as well um, I know for us when we started the Daniel Fassa Bridge to Healthy Living we looked a lot of it from an individual perspective how to motivate someone and I've noticed and this might be how you're connecting the dots of getting someone to make that paradigm shift that you are kind of funneling a lot of your resources on how can you can structurally change it from the leadership in the church to actually create yeah. um, an actual culture of health in the church to actually have that sprinkle down into changing people's mindset or how they view health. Can you talk a little bit about how do you um, talk about just connecting the dots? How do you move someone from 2% you know, of, of believing that it matters up the scale to kind of believing that our health matters to our spirituality? It's a, it's a great question, Cersei, and, and, and bring up a good point, I think, about, um, so I mentioned earlier that there's a clear understanding of the social determinants of, of relig religion and health generally, but also the role of uh, kind of that religious culture um, and how that inter interacts with social culture uh, in the way of, um, the culture of the church versus the secular culture, for example, or the church culture um, no different than or similar to the secular culture. And so th this comes up in conversations when I talk about like the uh, church donut or, or things that we serve at Sunday school and things like that, mm -hmm. or the meals that we serve at church events. Uh, I was in a, a leading a Sunday school class early on when I started kind of putting these things together. And, uh, they, they were comparing, the, the people in this, in this group were comparing um, eating unhealthily to drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. So they were like, you know, a glass of wine, no big deal, but too much, too bad. And there's this idea of moderation, same thing with food. Um, let's eat, eat. Um, we can eat a little bit, you know, have some cake and dessert and donuts, which you had to walk by, uh, by the way, to, to get to our wellness class. But um, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, I did tell them there was a no judgment zone that they could bring in any donuts they wanted, but uh, they're too worried about me, I guess. But um, because, by the way, Jesus said that he came eating and drinking, and they called him a glutton and a drunkard, right? So clearly, just because somebody eats a donut doesn't mean they're 
a glutton. And mm -hmm. so, but that was the conversation we were having. And I think it represents the culture because that comparison to me, there was, so in, in other words, what I said was, well, why don't we tap a keg next week at church or bring some wine and let's they, they won't kill it. just, you know, fellowship and have a good time. And then they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. I said, well, why not? I said, well, I'm not talking getting drunk. I'm just saying, have a beer, have some mm -hmm. wine. And they said, well, what if somebody struggles with that? Right. What if the, with self-control and, and we don't want to be the people who tempt that. Right. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I agree with that. But what if somebody struggles with overeating? Mm -hmm. What if somebody struggles with their diet? What if somebody, and this literally happened in that class, there was a gentleman went to his doctor, classic high cholesterol, high blood sugar. Doc says, dude, you got to get on a lower cholesterol diet. I didn't necessarily agree with the diet that he gave him, but largely uh, it was a general low cholesterol diet. So this gentleman had a decision to make. Do I go to church on Wednesday night mm -hmm. and be tempted by this food that's going to be there and probably eat it in defiance of my doctor and my health and my lack of self-control or do I stay at home? You know, and so what I'm getting at is I, I, I think, yes, that the church culture within the church itself, starting at the leadership and going down mm -hmm. is a no brainer, mm -hmm. strong influence. And you influence the leadership, you influence the church, you influence the community. I truly believe that that flow is, is right on. We're doing in San Antonio, we're, we're I'm doing some work with the, uh, uh, Baptist health and they have a, a pastor health initiative and that, that's what they're doing. They're starting pastor groups, the, what they call Barnabas groups that are teaching them about uh, various dimensions of health and wellness in hopes that that trickles down, like you said, to the church and they start changing the way they do things from uh, how they talk about um, gluttony from when do they even talk about it? I've always heard that that's the last sermon you give as a pastor is on gluttony uh, <laughs> before you retire or whatever. But you know, are they able to talk about these issues a bit more from the pulpit now because they're much more aware? There's the modeling aspect, the leadership aspect of they're just living a healthier physically, mentally. Uh, we, there's a large survey on uh, mental health issues in, in clergy. And that's a problem, just like it is in, in many other people. Um, that that would definitely trickle down. Also, it might affect policies that are made um, in in the church about what food can be served. You know, if you have little kids and you bring them to the nursery and then they're feeding them junk, and then you have to tell them that your kid's allergic to unhealthy food or something to try to get the, you know, the nursery folks to appreciate that or not feel bad for the kids. Like, oh, I'm sorry, your baby, your your parents don't give you unhealthy food here. I'll give it to you. Just don't tell them type stuff. Mm -hmm. The other aspect of this too, Cersei, that um, that I believe is important is not only is the clergy practicing it, but it affects policy. But I really am passionate on the theology and health side of developing a health and wellness ministry in that church, uh, just like you would children's ministry or worship ministry or, or, or service ministry. Uh, people of faith are so strong and dedicated to loving and helping others in the community. And that is what I would like to see encapsulated in health and wellness ministries, not only within the church, but again, out within the community. I don't know where the discrepancy happens or where and how that occurs without unpacking this theologically for them to align it with what they already view scripturally and making that connection there first punching them in the theological gut to some degree at times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even though it's uncomfortable for everybody um, to some degree, I think that's an important step as well because um, it's probably going to be all hands on deck. And that's what makes your question complicated is mm -hmm. there's probably so many levels yeah, so many creating that sort of change. And that brings us to um, your no sin diet um, topic, because I think a lot of times once you kind of wire the theology in your brain as to how this is becoming a sinful act on my part, the solution becomes very different. 
And so can you talk about the Nosen diet and how you process that, but also how that creates a different answer to the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, the, the don't, don't sin diet mm -hmm. or no sin either one. So, uh, because as you know, with, I, I, I look at a lot of myths and, and things. And so I had some students ask me um, a few years ago, hey, Dr. Ferris, if you were to write a diet book, because I teach a MythBuster class in the School of Public Health. And so um, train the students to use science to bust or verify various myths. And I'll usually make a joke about how much money I could be making if I just created some, some weight loss gum or something. And so um, they asked if I were to write a diet book, what would it be called? And off the cuff, I just said the don't send diet. Mm. And we all kind of laughed about that, but I thought about it more. Um, and like I said earlier, the, I, I've, I've, I don't know if you call it grown, but I'm still learning. You know what I mean? Like this is new to me. And my, part of me wants to just say that, yes, it's gluttony is a sin. Right. Sloth is a sin. This is what they are. And if you're doing that, if I'm doing that, then I'm sinning. And just like you said, the way I treat that mm -hmm. is very different than a self-help program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's spirit help is the way the scripture mm -hmm. talks about it. It's not a program. It's a person um, in the Holy Spirit. And so... Yes, that's where it originally came from. Now, the data would, would technically support this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the only one to have written on this for millennia. But the idea is, if we look at the data, if 70 to 80% of all chronic disease is preventable with three lifestyle behaviors, correct? Poor diet, eating a healthy diet, not smoking, and maintaining adequate physical activity. If you look at the average intake, like in calories, for example, in the U.S., it's, it's overeating on average. Uh, if you look at inactivity, um, and then you start labeling those, if you look into the definitions of gluttony and sloth, and th them coming from fleshly nature, appetites, mm -hmm. you have to come to the conclusion in my mind that the average American is probably gluttonous mm -hmm. to some degree. The average American is probably slothful. And we could prevent upwards of 80% of chronic disease if we didn't commit those two sins. It's arguable, right? So uh, drunkenness has also been called gluttony for many years. It's that way in the Canterbury Tales. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey Chaucer, it, it's arguable that smoking is gluttony too, if you look at the definition uh, inordinate desire, consuming beyond reason. Uh, Thomas Aquinas talks about it uh, being overconsumption from an appetite of the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's arguable that those three behaviors could be lumped into gluttony and sloth. And so that, that's the kind of the thinking. Now, I did the video uh, and, and written about it just to see what response I would get. Mm -hmm. Like, would it, and some people, are, they, they, you know, don't like it clearly, um, other people do. And so that's why I did it in the end was I was curious to see how people would respond. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fairly theologically sound. We know it's sound to the current health data, but health behavior data. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then we're just, so that's the jury's still yeah. out on that. Yeah. Um, the, the book I'm writing now, uh, there was a period of time where I did think about titling, titling it the don't sin diet, purely from what we just talked about, but also from, you got to think about things like, right, what, what would be a title of a book that somebody would pick up off right. the shelf? And like, you know, you think about those things, yeah. and you, you're, you both are writers. And so I was thinking, well, maybe people would pick that up. So I started asking around and some would be like, no, I would just dismiss it immediately. Mm -hmm. Others would be like, well, it'd be worth, I'd pick it up and at least look at the back. The, the story the better title would probably be the grace diet, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, because um, the, the, from the Christian worldview, s sin has been overcome. We're not enslaved to sin anymore due to grace, but the grace that motivates. So when the J Jewish religious leaders brought the a, a woman who was apparently caught in adultery to Jesus, 
And um, this was the famous event where he knelt down and wrote something in the sand. And we don't know why he did that twice. And then they, all the uh, religious leaders left. Mm -hmm. And so it was Jesus and that woman. And he, she said, is, is, he asked, is there anybody here to condemn you for your sin? Um, and she said, no one, Lord. And he said, neither do I. But then he says, go and sin no more. So the grace that that woman experienced, that I believe I have experienced, is what motivates this, what we call theologically progressive sanctification. This idea of being more and more holy and loving people unconditionally more and more and more, agape love, right? So it's that same basis and the pursuit of holiness you have to consider, as we mentioned earlier on, the body is God's temple. It's a member of Christ's body to be unified and functional um, physically and mentally. And then what am I, is my lifestyle undermining that? Is it increasing my risk of disease, death, and disability? Is it reducing my function? Is it reducing my mental health? And is that behavior rooted in me just satisfying a fleshly appetite, mm -hmm. right, for food and activity? So to come all the way back around to your question is that's where it came from. And um, we're, jury, again, is still out on, on how people are going yeah. to respond. Yeah, and, and I love the way that you kind of pointed in the direction of grace because that is – ultimately where the whole power for this whole Christian walk lies is, is in that power of grace. And that's wonderful. Um, you also mentioned something that I think a lot of us get trapped in is the concept of moderation. And oh I think you mix that in a spiritual context, which is what is too much, what is too little, and you're trying to walk this line. You talk about a checklist. Um, you know, because I think we throw out that term moderation, we'll just do it in moderation, don't drink too much, you know, so talk a little bit of how you, how do you walk that line of moderation and talk to us a little bit about that checklist that you, you talked about. Oh, okay, it's a great, great, again, another great question. Um, moderation perplexes me. Mm -hmm. um, because I used to think it was simple. But the more I look at it and study it, it's not right. Yeah. Um, it says, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, right? Paul says that. So in Ephesians, but when am I drunk, mm -hmm. right? When am I not drunk? At what point do I cross this line? Is that a self-perceived thing or is that a blood alcohol level thing? Right. Um, like when, when, and it's different between all three of us, probably when that would occur, how many drinks it would take mm -hmm. to get to that point. Which also brings up an issue of self-control, right? In that debauchery, for example, uh, which I, I equate food waste to debauchery as well. Um, and so, uh, especially when people need it. And um, so there's this idea of control related to moderation. There's this idea that certain things are okay in moderation, but other things are not. Like lust is not okay in moderation. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, illegal drugs okay in moderation if so which ones if not which ones and why mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't I haven't found a clear-cut answer I'll tell you the way I do it the the way I do it now and is because we know the health data so for example if at some point we lose control to that whatever it is then I believe it crosses the line of moderation if it is known that if you keep doing it in that way, whatever it is, it damages God's temple or reduces the functionality of you as a member of Christ's body, it's beyond moderation. Mm -hmm. So Paul, when his first letter to the Corinthians, um, he's writing and the Corinthians were like, yeah, but all, he's talking about you know, uh, different behaviors and how they should be acting, but their, their response, and he writes this quote is, yeah, but everything is lawful, right? Under this grace freedom idea, right? Everything is lawful. But then Paul's like, yeah, but, but some things hurt you, right? Like some things aren't helpful. Yeah, everything's They're helpful. like, yeah, everything is, everything is lawful. It's all is lawful. Yeah, but some things enslave you. Mm -hmm. And so to me, those are two indicators of, crossing the line. I don't think it's clear cut. 
So yeah. what I talk about a lot is what we do know in the evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a clear starting point. So uh, at what point does alcohol become destructive? It's different for everybody. Uh, what about diet? Like how much sugar? So the Frank Hugh and the folks at Harvard might say that one sugar sweetened beverage a day, which increases risk of type two diabetes and heart disease is beyond moderation, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the data relative to somebody drinks like a soda once a month or two. Physical activity, at what point can I be so inactive that it begins to damage, right? So what I've done is on the first part of moderation is connect people to what we know about health behavior and risk and start there and then use your own freedom in the Holy Spirit to navigate right. from there. The checklist that you mentioned, if it's the self-control checklist, um, one thing that rocked my world when I started making these connections, and I'll be honest, my first response to this idea of Cersei, like you said, was about if I do see it as fleshly appetites and desires and potentially sinful or missing the mark of holiness and love, then I treat that differently, right? Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden I was like, oh no, I spent all these years studying psychological self-help stuff that now is irrelevant to the Christian. That was my first thought. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, and I wasted all that time and money. Um, <laughs> But then over time, I realized, well, no, I'm just, I just happen to be an expert in the flesh and the soul. That, yeah. That's just my expertise. <laughs> and once I realized that, then I realized, you know, there are certain things that we can do from a regulatory standpoint that are just wise, right? Yeah. So there's the scripture that, for example, that says, make no provision for the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so you might've heard me say, but I ask people all the time, how easy is it for you to eat unhealthily in your house? And they're like, well, it's easy. And I was like, well, that's problematic, right? If you're going to want to eat healthier, it's constant goal conflict. It's constant temptation. Knowing that overeating is rooted now in an appetite of the flesh, don't make provision for it. Don't think about it. Um, I'm not saying don't watch cooking shows, but be careful, right? Um, or whatever it might be for you. So yeah, my right. wife, for example, um, we could have chocolate chip cookies in the house and she not even touch them, or maybe eat one every so often. I will devour them and rationalize that, you know what, I better go ahead and eat them so that they're, they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> Have you done that before? And I don't yeah, want to throw them away that. because Get I don't want to waste them. any money. That's like just yeah. throwing money in the trash. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm just going to eat it. And then, and I'm not saying that's healthy by any means, but I'm just, that's, I, I know that's me. Yeah. And so I make, I do things in my life to not make provision for those things that I can't control. I can have a glass of wine and the knock on wood, Lord willing, I have no mm. issues with desire for drunkenness or any of that. But I have family members and friends who are and do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So everybody is different to some degree. So, but I believe scripture, there is this self-control checklist. In Proverbs, it talks about a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Mm -hmm. And so the checklist to me is like, how do we start building these walls mm -hmm. to help us out? It's not the final solution, which in this paradigm of a Christian worldview is a spiritual solution, which is walking in the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the wise thing for us to do. And I do lay those, those things out. There's so much we can learn. And so there's so much we can think about. To me, this, is, this conversation, particularly religion and health, is not, is not divisive. It's unifying. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes from a place of love and grace and truth. And sometimes those things are hard to hear. Sometimes we learn things that we're doing are just not aligned with our views. Mm -hmm. And I think we can be better for that. And so I encourage anybody who's interested in this topic, um, even though the discussions might be difficult and the self-reflection might be difficult, th there's already too, too much dissension and rivalry and other works of the flesh currently in our world. This should not be another one of those because it's all about unifying the body of Christ uh, in particularly. Those researching this topic and those in the public health uh, medical world 
um, it's realizing that there is a connection and that it's okay to accommodate people's religious views in health prescription because they're already making decisions in their life, maybe health decisions based on their religious views. Mm -hmm. And so to be uh, cognizant of that and appreciative of that, even if you don't necessarily uh, agree with that. Uh, I was, one last story, I was in a talk with some public health professionals, big name people, and I was bringing up this religious health connection and talking about some of the folks here in Texas in the South that, again, are making health decisions. Should they get cancer treatment or not? based on their religious views. Mm -hmm. Should they get this COVID vaccine, yes or no, based on religious views, mm -hmm. Wear a mask. right? And the, the uh, public health professional mm -hmm. said, well, I don't believe in all that. I'm like, it doesn't matter if you believe that because Miss Jones believes that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mr. Jones believes that. And so to some degree, even if our views differ, um, it's still appreciating where that other person is coming from because it's valuable to them. And if we truly care and love people, then we have to be able to pay attention to what's valuable to them, even if we don't necessarily agree with it, to have a reasonable conversation that's more enlightening and being better for it than, than just than, than making things worse and, and, and demeaning people and, and their particular views. Uh, the last thing I'll say is if people do have interest in this, please, please reach out. Um, and maybe us three, we can talk more too, but Anybody else, please feel free to reach out. They can go to theologyandhealth.org mm -hmm. for the ministry side of things. Uh, of course, there is fitnesspudding.com that, that people can check out. I am starting a new website. It might be a little slow, but it's called changemaintain.com. And that's where I'm going to start putting a lot of the health, general health behavior stuff that I do. Anybody on the academic side as well, uh, feel free to reach out and then we'll go from there. <laughs>